All right, I think we're probably ready sure. for uh, everyone's glasses are, are dumped. So we've talked about the, the past and maybe even the present of, of Pipeworks or, or the near past. So now I want to get into the present and future of Pipeworks. So this is your newest and latest beer. Uh, this is called, first of all, as a huge fan of this beer, of this movie, thank you for this for this one. Hey, careful man, there's a beverage here. Uh, this movie is way overquoted, and I don't care because I love it so much. Uh, so uh, tell us about this beer, how it fits into the Pipeworks ethos, and where what we can expect from this, from you guys. This is a, another beer that we kind of just quickly floated around when we were in Belgium, if you remember, actually. But we were talking about, like, Clear Pepsi. I don't know if anyone remembers Clear Pepsi yeah. from the 90s. Yeah. So we're like, oh, Clear Stout. And then we're like, oh, it's kind of cliche. We won't do it. Uh, not that we knew how. But I mean, the way that this came about is, is like, you posted what? on our... Yeah, right. Well, I mean, like... Well, one we had talked about it in Belgium. Right. Well, one day, Garrett, like, we have our own, like, forum for in, internally in the in the brewery. So, like, all the employees, like, we have different, like, uh, forums for, like, different parts of the brewery, like, distribution, yeah. you know, all just our different general... Divi all our different divisions. Yeah, our divisions. Our divisions of one or two men. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, like, I mean, Garrett posted, he was like, I want to I see people, like, posting new recipes right. besides me and Garrett coming up with all the recipes. Or Scott. Uh, or Scott. Yep. Um, so, like, you know, we wanted to see the other employees come up with ideas for recipes uh, besides the brewers. Um, and so this is actually the first of that. Like, I mean, this is Mike, our, our operations manager. Yep. Um, he's our jack of all trades, I guess. Um, and, like, this was his idea. Like, he wanted to do this... Uh, white Russian imperial stout. Um, so like, you know, for all of you fans of uh, the movie, Big and Lebowski. As, as Big I had Lebowski, mentioned earlier, you know, BJ. I was about um, to say the Big Bukowski. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, that's not right. <laughs> BJ, you know, BJ went to art school, and BJ is a great artist, and that's one reason when we were in Belgium, I knew we could do this because BJ would do the art, and we'd come up with the recipes, and we had the technical kind of know-how to follow through on it. But what happened is, as we got more into the building the brewery process, BJ put his art gear away hmm. and wasn't able really to get to it. So we were having to rely on, um, you know, uh, people like Jason Burke for their great art, but we can't rely on them every time we need them. Right. So just recently, now that we've kind of leveled off a little bit at the brewery, BJ has been able to pull out his art gear back, and he just started cranking up these labels like two a day, three a day, and this it's, was. It's this hard was, when you make a new beer every this was one of the and first, you're like, I need a new label. <laughs> and this is one of the first or second ones that he completely hand drew. Yeah. And so I mean, he's just, I love this label. He's just surprising us with all these labels, and it, it's really good. So, so you're going to see a big, a bunch of changes with uh, Pipeworks label art as so, BJ gets to be able to go back and and draw them all from hand again. So on the label here, it's actually Mike. Uh, who came up with the beer, but in the the famous like robe scene in the supermarket with the milk carton. Uh, so yeah, and, the and, then, and then you got the rug there. in the bowling alley, and then of course the the font is actually the the font from the opening scene. Yeah, uh, right. Lebowski, so and the star. Like I I really went out of my way on this one. <laughs> I was having right. a lot of fun because I mean it's one of. I remember when I was in college, my uh, one of my friends had the big Lebowski machine. Which was just a VCR set on a VCR TV on repeat that just had the Big Lebowski in it. So like 24 hours a day in the apartment was the Big Lebowski. I should be in the bottle shop. Yeah. That's cool. And uh, so then onto the beer, I guess. Right? Yeah, no, I want to talk about the beer, but I also before I forget, want to talk about future labels you're gonna do, guys. Uh, what is it? Barrel Age. Jones Dog, perhaps. Yep, BJ, oh, for sure. the hand, that one's also in this uh, is recent wave yeah, yeah. of beers. Is BJ Handrew the, uh, the the Imperial Jones Dog as well? If the Barrel Age Jones Dog is that picture I saw, it's it'd be Game of Jones. What? Barrel Game, of, Game of, of Jones. Okay. No, it's, it's gonna. It's just I think it's just Barrel Age Jones. I think. Okay. Yeah, right, it's works. gonna be the no, Jones. Yeah. You did you draw that picture? Which one? The Jones. Game of Jones. Throne. No, no, the dog. Oh, the that's dog. a photograph. Oh, yeah. That's a photograph. That's an actual photograph of my dog. Okay, I was yeah. going to say. The one where I lose his tongue and everything? Yeah. No, yeah, that's a that's I was a like, photo. oh my god. I'm not that much of a nigga. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> holy cow. You might have picked the wrong job. Uh, <laughs> this one here. No, 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 no. Oh, not, not that one. one. No, the, the one. No, the barrel age one that you're thinking about doing on a uh, lacquer, on a lacquer, on a wood label. This is uh, Bobby talking again to me. Oh, that was actually, that's just a mock-up, and no, I didn't do that drawing. You didn't draw that? But I will draw a drawing like that. Okay, because that's going to be yeah. outrageous. That's how they're all going to look, actually, is those. You can't see it yet. Yeah, you can't see it. <laughs> anyway, back to, gonna this be like that. Uh, back to this dog. Back to this beer. Uh, well, 
talk. What is a white Russian stout? It's a real thing, actually. I mean, the, the white stout is historically a real thing. Really? Yeah, for sure. And the, the word stout was first used in England Just to describe strong big, beer. Strong beer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It had nothing to do with the roast right. and dark right. malt. So, I mean, the first stouts were actually probably of this color. Right. Uh, and they're around 8% alcohol, so not quite 10.5 like this is. Yes. Um, so this beer is, uh, so what we were trying to do with this, it's like, a, it's a plan where it's, you know, the famous drink is the White Russian um, in the Big Lebowski. And so like, we we're trying to emulate, you know, Mike, Mike was trying to so emulate. So like Kahlua, you get a little bit of coffee flavor. Right. Vanilla, obviously, from cream. Right. Um, and we have the milk. Uh, so there's milk, there's lactose right. in this beer. Um, and then, uh, then there's chocolate. And the chocolate is in there just to try to like, and this, and this is the first time we did it. It, 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 was, it was definitely, I mean, it's definitely a clear beer. It was definitely a little more pale um, before we added the coffee. And the coffee is actually what, what's adding kind of the, uh, the the color to this beer at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really pale beer, actually, before the coffee goes And in. I've already started reading up on how to extract the color from the coffee beans. So we get the coffee in there. Really? Oh, without the color. Yes. Yeah, like <laughs> so without, uh, I don't know, trying to tie everything up in a, a pretty bow too much, I mean, I think it's kind of cool that your first beer, your homebrew beer that we tasted here was the pastrami on rye, which is this wacko out of there, out there beer, uh, to this last beer and your newest beer that is yet to be released, your white Russian imperial stout. I mean, I don't know about you guys, I see a lot of similarities in just the inventiveness and kind of just general, I don't know. And we're having a really fun. great, we're yeah. having a great time this past few months because we we did, like I said, we did kind of level off. Where we don't have to go. Okay, which beer we've already brewed that we put put in the schedule now? And now, you know, we've got other brewers that are coming up with recipes that we can work on together, like Mike and Kate, who are our two newest brewers. And um, BJ can go back and put his time into the artwork. Yeah. Um, so we can focus on the beers a lot more rather than just focusing on having to make sure we're not going out of business. Yeah, it's, not, it's not me and Garrett behind so the kettle. So we're finally we're finally kind of getting you know? we're finally kind of getting back to that point that we were when we were homebrewing, where we say, okay, this is an idea. Let's put it. Let's put it in plan and let's let's execute it. Yeah, so we kind of what your idea for Pipeworks we're always yes, had been. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Come full circle. What you said, awesome. what do we think about Pipeworks? Well, yeah, we're finally kind of coming back to where we want to be. And what will that be? What can people expect from you? guys in the next six months year um, two years a lot more barrel aged beers um, I mean that's that's a huge thing I mean you haven't seen it because we're actually aging them um, and but we've been keeping a cycle going now so like once they start getting released you know every six months we should have some big barrel aged releases um, more inventive things like I mean the sky's the limit I think the my favorite thing about beer and what has happened in the last like 10 to 20 years with the craft beer revolution is that like oh I hate that or I can't believe I used the craft beer revolution anyway I uh, see Seasonals are the hot new thing Our right seasonals, now. Seasonals, yeah. Um, but I mean, we're gonna keep pushing the boundaries. You know, like we're gonna keep playing with right. flavors. We're gonna keep using, like, I mean, we're such culinary people. Like, we love food and like food and beer. It's all the same thing. You know, like we're looking at ingredients that you use in cooking, and that's what should go into beer. Um, like, I mean, you look at classically into beer before they had hops. Um, and yeah, you're looking at all the yeah, gruits. They're, they're being spiced of all sorts right. of other I mean, things. They're looking at so hops, many yeah. different things. They were so much more creative in, yeah. in a sense. Um, and so I think we look to those older times and like and all the new ingredients that we have access to. So um, we're going to keep going. So. Well, well, we got a group full of people. If anyone still has beer, if you close, the, the idea was Mike wanted to make the beer. So yeah, if, close you, your if eyes. you closed your eyes and drank it, you would think you were drinking like a dark stout. So if anyone still has it, like it. <laughs> yeah, or they can get more and they can try it then. Mm. Well. Guys, thank you so much for kind of taking us through the story of Pipeworks. I know I learned a whole lot more uh, about you guys, and I think it was really cool of you guys to sit down and kind of open yourselves up to some of the people who love your beers. Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, now I would like to say if anyone has any questions, we'll take a couple minutes of it and just raise your hand, and BJ will pick who he wants. To that guy, he, he was quick. He jumped the gun, man. He's not over it. I'll repeat the question so it can be heard for the, right, cool. yeah. Uh, I just want to follow up on your, your comment over the last 10 or 20 years. Where do you think things are going? I mean, is, is this, quote, revolution about to continue? How far will it go? Oh, God. So how far will this craft brew beer revolution as a whole go? Correct. Well, I think I might have somewhat of an answer. I mean, I think you got some divergent things. You have a bunch of people that... Um, you can have some big breweries open up, you know, like whatever what's happening in Asheville, Carolina right now, which is, you know, New Belgium and Oscar Blues and everyone kind of building the big breweries. And then so you're going to have a bunch of kind of mid-range breweries open up like that. And then you're going to have 
small guys that are doing kind of like what we're doing. So what we're doing is not exactly unique, but we think we do it pretty well in a different thing. So there'll be a lot more guys doing unique things like us. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have a lot of kind of mom and pop guys that are, um, which traditionally has been kind of the home brewer, or not the home brewer, the, the pro brewer out in the rural areas. Right, right. You know, across across the country in, in small towns, you'd have your little brewery. And I, I think you're going to see a lot more of all three of those things. Yeah, and, so, I, and, and I think that we, like, you know, when you look at the, like, evolution of beer and, like, you saw the big crash of breweries, like, you it's know, because everyone was trying to get into it to make, oh, after right. Prohibition. After they Prohibition, made, like, in the 90s. well, I mean, like, after Prohibition, we still had a decent amount of breweries in the United States, but then, like, we leveled off, I think, at the yeah. lowest point, we had 85 breweries in the United States. And then World the War II and United rationing kind of crashed the world. Um, I, I, I think that craft brewing is here to stay. I think that we're not going to lose out. I don't think this is a fad. I think that people are realizing uh, more and more that they want a quality product, that we're here alongside with great wine, we're here with great whiskey um, as a, an affordable luxury that's delicious and there's a lot of love put into it and so people want to enjoy this product. And it's not to say that we can't have a PBR you know, while we're like hanging out with our buddies in the garage because I like, say PBR is probably the most drank beer at Pipeworks um, because we make 10% beer and it's hard to drink that all day. Uh, but, um, you know, like, I mean, we still want this, we want amazing flavors. We want to enjoy great meals and we want to enjoy great beer together. And I think that's why craft beer will always live now that people are educated about it. Anything else right there? Would you guys ever do like a, a really simple beer? Because I feel like a lot no, of beers. Not gonna, no, yeah, of course. Well, I mean, just like I'm just thinking, like you know, New Galeris makes totally naked, right. which is just well, and, the most and, and so. Down. And that's a that's a really great point. So, so well, will you guys ever do a? I just want to repeat. Well, will you guys yeah. ever do a simple, straightforward right. beer? No, that is a very great point. Because Chris, Chris is sitting there going, "Oh, Piperworks, you guys make these crazy, crazy beers." Well. That's not who we are as brewers, believe it or not. I mean, that it's one facet of who we are sure. as brewers, but we also have the utmost respect for the Lewis. Dan, Dan Carey is one of our most favorite people He's in the world. He's a hero. Um, and but just because we had to start the way we did, we had to start in bombers in 22 ounce bottles, and we kind of had to go big. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have plans to hopefully have a brew pub. That would be great if that's in our cards eventually. Uh, once we get the bottle shop open, um, we'll be doing growler fills. And something that we absolutely love is the simplicity and the beauty of doing a simple beer right. So then you're going to start to see the 4% beers come out. A lot of the beers that we actually make now started as 4 or 5% beers, sure. but we had to scale them up to be bigger. Even like, the big beers like, have gotten scaled up, you right. know? That's serious. The 8% wasn't enough. Right. The 8% is <laughs> now 11%, you know, the ones that are 5 are now 8s or 9s. Like At Her Majesty's Pleasure, that's an English summer ale, which is a little known style here. Yeah. Um, and that's supposed to be a 4% beer. Beer. And the first time we brewed it, it was around a 4% beer. But right. then we brewed it to be 7, and now it's going bigger. And that's because you, you can't feel like you, to make your margin a, or a value you, proposition. A value. You yeah. can't sell a bomber of right. 4% right. beer for but $9. But once we have other avenues I mean, of selling beer besides yeah. just the, the 22 ounce. You we know, quickly realized that, you know, it's funny, the, the bottle and the label and the cap. It doesn't matter if there's an imperial stout in there, it's a pale ale. The, 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 the bottle still costs more than the beer inside of, you know, when it comes to business. So what, once we can get those other avenues of outlets, we, you, we that's the whole other side of us is that we really love simple, small beer. Mm -hmm. Cool. Up front? Mike? No, nope. uh, I thought I was no, no. choosing. You're next. Chris. You're, he's next. You're okay, next. go, go. <laughs> what's, what's up, Mike? Uh, self distribution. A lot of people think that this is sort of like a saving grace mm -hmm. uh, startup brewery. Absolutely. There's some economics involved in there. I'm wondering if there's also a burden that that place is on Stanford because you cover a lot more ground um, than most people don't realize. And also, with that self-distribution angle, how do you guys work in shops like this where you're dealing against traditional distributors that are lobbying for space, lobbying for tap tables and bars? Right. How does that work? So talk a little bit about uh, the fact that you guys self-distribute, meaning you deliver your own beers to the store and you're competing against guys who have huge multi or, or interstate uh, wholesale companies doing this for them, you are competing for the same shelf space as them. Um, so the, the lobbying group that's controlled by the big distributors in Springfield, um, very against the self-distribution because they thought every new, every new brewery is going to be self-distributed. Well, since the law was passed, which was passed right when we got our space and we were the second or third to do it, and right now we're still the largest in the state that self-distributes, which is not a lot of beer, but we're still the largest. Um, 
They thought every single brewery was just going to go, oh, we're all of a sudden self-distributing. Well, what happened is that's not true. 70%, 75% or so of the breweries that have opened since the law was passed chose to go with the distributor because they don't want the headaches of It's a lot self. of work. It is a lot of work. Um, what are the headaches and yeah? It's just running a whole other business, and we it is. we didn't we, we opened maybe, a brewery we, and a distributor. We maybe underestimated that a little bit. We know we had the capability to do both, but we didn't realize it would be literally like running two businesses, right. and we're splitting employees' times between. So we kind of had to start thinking of it as two businesses. Right. Um, but you know that that fear that every new brewery is just going to go self-distribute and no one's going to sign up distributors, it, it never came to fruition. Yeah, it's, it's, not just, it's just not true. I mean, because you have someone that's going to open up and wants to do a 5,000-year brewery. They, they don't need the headaches of trying to self-distribute right. 5,000 barrels of beer. So one of your wives going to break off and do your own distribution thing and <laughs> sell for $100 million? Oh, never mind. Anyway, I think, uh, I think inside baseball joke He's referring right there. to uh, two yeah. brothers. and Yeah. So. Anyway, a lot of money Great in distribution. <laughs> I think BJ's got the next uh, question. I'll take you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's uh, the question is kind of fitting with the previous, with the, the question before. Um, as far as compromises involved, and it mm. sounds like you guys have been able to stay away from, you know, selling your soul for donut kind of a compromise. Sure. But what are the compromises that you've had to make? Tons. Uh, yeah, and they're, 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 all unfortunately, the time. because to us they seem like big things, right. but then when you look at it in the macrocosm opposed to the microcosm, right. you go, hey, no one notices that. Yeah. And you know, we feel like us doing one little thing that's not the right thing or whatever, it's like, oh my God, we've just, like you said, sold our soul. And it's like, well, that's. A week in the brewery feels like a month. It literally yeah, it does. really does. And right. we go, no one's going to talk about this, and it's, right. it's not going to be. Are episode. there any examples that you can use that might be used as kind of a. I mean, like, I mean, what happens all the time? It's hard to say. I mean, there's like us not bottle conditioning anymore. That's uh, one. Yeah, that's a, like, that's a huge one. It's like, oh, they're gonna the, the press is gonna kill us because they wrote, you know, yeah, Josh and that was like, from the Tribs, like, oh, these guys are doing something so different. They're bottle conditioning stuff, and then we didn't do it because there was, like Chris said, we came out of the gate. There was a lot of demand for the beer, so we're like, well, we need to make beer now because right. this bottle conditioning model, we'll go out of business with that. We can't sit on the beer for yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's hard because like I mean, as much as you want to like be like in this like beautiful mystical world of like I'm a craftsman I'm gonna do this beautiful thing right. it's gonna be all pure and beautiful it's like at the end of the day you're still running a business right. and like man if money's not rolling in that door you're not gonna be doing that beautiful thing but like I said anymore. there's a little bit of a time warp because to us it feels like oh my god we've let everyone down and we realize it's just a temporary situation because once you get kind of past, past that hump and level out then you can start to go back to the things you want to do rather than you have to do. Right. So if we wanted to go back and start bottle conditioning now, well, probably in like six months to a year, yeah. we can start doing that, and we will start doing that with certain beers. Yeah. So it, it, it's really about don't be so stubborn yeah. <laughs> to stick to what you know, not compromise if yeah. that's going to put you out of business. Yeah. I mean, you go and you come in all starry eyed, and right. you have like these ideals, and then you're like, uh, you know, there's a reality, and right. sometimes you have to make a slight compromise. But the, the idea is eventually you'll get back to the, where there'll be a nice middle ground. So, anyone else? You right there on the. Uh, just out of curiosity, what, were there other names that were close in the running of besides Pepper? There was again? other names other than. Pepper. Oh yeah, the, the original uh, name was Da Vinci Brewing Company. Da Vinci Company. Brewing Company, uh, and then uh, I think Flying Machine was after which, that, which that's was part a, of the a follow up of Flying Machine. And then there might have been one or two in between, but I don't yeah, know. yeah. Uh, pi when Pipeworks popped up, like it, it came up in conversation, like. Uh, it, it stuck. It, it went really well because, like, uh, I, I can't quite remember exactly how it happened. I remember the story behind it, but like, but when, was, when the name, like, when the name came, like, I told Urban, like, I said yeah. Pipeworks. It just like shot out of my mouth, and he was like, "Oh, that's good. That's good." And I was like, "Ah, oh, yeah." I was like, "We're Pipeworks now." I was like, "I don't know why, <laughs> but now we're Pipeworks." And then you own it. And then back there, yeah, you. Yeah. So when you started out, you kind of bootstrapped everything together financially, mm -hmm. and then you used Kickstarter to kind of get yourself going. Sure. What about now? Now that you've been successful, your beers are great, everyone loves them, are people falling over themselves to try to offer you money to invest, or not so much? So you guys basically had to come up with a new method to fund a brewery. Now that you guys have seen some success, has uh, funding become easier? I think there's two avenues to that. I think, A, when we were first doing it, like I said, there were no breweries when we were first trying to do this. You know, Half Acre was just building the facility. Metro was just getting into their facility. Um, so, and there was a lot of attention on us because of the Kickstarter. So there was a lot of phone calls and like, oh, we'll give you the money. We'll, you know, we'll do this. But we, we really wanted to stay true and not try to sell anything off. Yeah, I mean, even, even during the Kickstarter days, there was a lot of people like, 
before. There with money. But we also we didn't know how to. Do, we, we didn't know how to do that either. So. We also didn't want to like give up our so company, man. With, you know, with, like. with that point saying, now there's a lot of people trying to start breweries, so it might be a little more thinned out where people aren't just looking at us to give their money. Like if you want to invest in a brewery, you know, it's like hey, you got 40 options now because everyone's trying to start a brewery. Where yep. before it's like oh, I want to start, I want to invest in a brewery. Oh, there's Pipeworks. So, so um, I've got, I've, I'm sorry. Were you no, no, yeah. No, so I've, I've got a question now. <laughs> I heard a rumor that one of the three batches of this triple batch was double dry hopped with Amarillo. No, I think that was a previous. Uh, no, no, this what, entire. Is this, one? Uh, this one? Is this the triple? No, it's the one we sent to yeah. G uh, the GABF. No, this is no, this is the the batch after the GABF. This oh, okay. is all yeah. Galaxy and Amarillo. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one thing about our beers, a lot of times, is sometimes our, our hops aren't where we thought they were, and so sometimes. Yep. Ninja vs. Unicorn is always the culprit. Uh, sometimes yeah. NVU gets like a magical boost. Um, this is <laughs> from non blending This is an Garb awesome batch. Yeah. Yeah. Like NVU. So yeah, yeah, so like, all right, so this particular batch, there's a ton of Galaxy and Amarillo in, which those two hops don't ever come into this beer. Um, and so we, we usually don't say anything about what we do with NVU. It just kind of happens when it does. Like, whatever awesome hops like happen across the doorway, we're just like, put it in NVU. And we'll see what, like, you know, it's kind of for the fans, you know, it's like, if you buy NVU all the time, like, sometimes you get a bonus. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I mean, that's how it works out, you know, like, we don't, we don't go on our little blog or whatever and be like, yeah, you know, batch 257 NVU, man, it's all spiked to the Jones, you know? Uh, it's just, you know, it is what it is, and so, like, if you are a fan of ours, like, sometimes you get a little reward. Cool. <laughs> Magic hops. All right, it's always good anyway. We'll take a couple more questions over there. Do you have a quality control process? I mean, I was gonna ask <laughs> yeah, we do. Okay. An intense one. Consistency is what a lot of the breweries look for, and it seems like the, the process model you guys have here, it's maybe certain well, things are you're looking for consistency, but other things. Well, it, it's not. So the question is, about, talk about quality sorry. control. Yeah. And how it affects consistency, and yeah. how consist, how important is consistency yeah. to you? So I mean, we have an extensive uh, quality control model, and it's partly out of necessity. And, yeah, you know, it's not uh, based on consistency between beer to like between like NVU to NVU. Yeah, we, I mean, that's a that's a good point. We're asking more about quality control, like in terms of quality control, or quality control in terms of batch to batch variations of brewing, because they're two totally different things. No, I'm talking about a batch going out. Do you taste every batch that goes out? Oh, absolutely. We also like, uh, I mean, we have, uh, I mean, we, we like keep like rows of bottles. I would, I would, I would easily say, and some bigger professional brewers come in, that because of our tech, technical nerdiness or whatever, our quality control is more extensive than a lot of other breweries. I remember Laffler coming to our brewery, he's like, hey, you guys got graphs. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> dude, you got graphs. Got so we, we, we track more things that need to be tracked. Um, we don't always have the time to go back and look at the data and extrapolate what we need to, unless it's an issue, but we, we're, we're amassing a ton of data and for, for those reasons, so. We'll take, uh, yeah, just a couple more. What's up? You're talking about the bottling system. Are you guys gonna go back to 12 ounces? Are you guys gonna stay in 22 ounces? ounces? I've seen some little 12 ounce bombers, like what? ball glasses of pipeworks. What? Oh, oh, those are from Europe. That's th oh, those are made in those Europe. Those are only in Europe, that's, man. That's made in Alvina. I've had like two, so. Yeah, yeah we had. Uh, I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I was like, we have never. No, that's, going. yeah. The, the, are those are actually 11.2s, sir. Are, <laughs> are, you know, uh, the Barrel Age series is going to be exclusively 12 ounce bottles, uh, so we don't like burn your palate and so that you can actually like buy those and they're not going to be super expensive. So, yeah, all the Barrel Age beers are going to be in 12 ounce bottles. Right. One more question. Ready to pick it. Red? Red. Stupid. Oh, double! Double! He's, he's just Son of a bitch. Yeah. Let's do it. What, what percentage of your recipes would you say are in bottles? I mean, just ballpark figures? All of them? All of them. Part. What do you mean? Like, I mean, all of them. How many recipes? Oh. So, so how many of your are recipes? Are you asking if I have, like, this, like, magic logbook of, like, unbrewed recipes? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, like, I mean, when we come up with a recipe, it gets brewed. Um, okay. Pretty much bar none. Like, um, at this point, like, I, I think originally, like, we would have had that kind of thing, but now, like, right. we, we just brew beer now, like, um, yeah, we also don't pilot beers anymore. Right. Yeah, you start to kind oh, of... just make them. 
<laughs> we just go for it. Like, this beer was never five gallon batch, like, you know, the white stout. It was just brewed. Okay. We just you go for it. Look like, okay, this week we're gonna bottle this type of beer. It's just like, whatever you Well, we have, we have Garrett's insane matrix of uh, spreadsheet That should logic. be a, a beer name. You have BJ's Weirdo Brown Ale. <laughs> Garrett's insane matrix should That's be a good idea. Beer. Garrett actually has a really crazy way of dictating what gets brewed when, and it's it's not based on what kind of beer it is, it's based on the fermentation schedule. So like we have A's, B's, C's, and D's, and it's based on how long something takes in a tank. I made something called a brew pewter. The brew pewter, yeah, it is. We have a Google Doc brew pewter. Uh, it's, it's made so that we can like schedule everything so that like the bottling happens at the right times and so that tanks are emptied. Um, in sequence, because I there's, mean, there's an allowance given the the brewers in like a class A to class E beer is weighted a certain amount. So within a certain period, say four weeks, you have this allowance to do your schedule. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that way, that I mean, the key at Pipeworks is to never have an empty tank. Period. Um, the only time an empty tank is allowed is for repassivation. So when we're we're repickling the steel, um, that's the only time a tank is allowed to be empty. But if a fermenter becomes empty, it's expected to be brewed in that day. Well, I think uh, that's about it, guys. Thank you so Yay! much. Thank you. Um, feel free to uh, stick around for a couple more minutes if you want. I don't know how long you guys have, but if you have a couple yeah, okay. minutes, stick you guys can come up and shake hands. We've got to finish the bottles Whoa, that are open. they're going to touch me now? Yeah, right? <laughs> We're not going to open any more bottles, but the bottles that are open, we'll, we'll let people drink through if they Cheesy wish. Cheesy blue for everyone! <laughs> we'll set them up there, and if you guys will just allow us to kind of, uh, you know, fold up your chairs behind you and stuff like that. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate you guys working with us. And Thank you, guys. Thank you.